And um, it's it's such a great joy to have you all with us from all over the world as we just read, also from many different agencies. And we sure hope that this seminar will help you on your own missions journey and also give you insight how you can support others on their mission journey. Today, Hannes will give us an overview about the missionary life cycle, and then he will focus on the on-field phase. Tomorrow, Ryan will share with us about the pre-field preparation. And on Friday, we will hear um, Dick Elisha about re-entry. Um, let me just give us a reminder of some practical things before I introduce Hannes a little bit closer. Shelby sent out an email with some handouts and an outline to you to, to, um, yesterday. I suggest have them either printed out already. The field notes that Honnett prepared gives you a great outline to follow his teaching and also to jot down some notes. Mm. I'm very grateful that we have Honnett Stets with us as our speaker for today. Hannes is a long-term Weimar, and he, together with his family, served many, many years in Albania. And um, it, is it Hannes 10 or 12 years that you came back to Germany? Uh, 11. 11, so in the middle. 11 years ago, he came back with his family to Germany. Hannes is the convener for the member care circle of Weimar Central Europe. And he's one of the pillars for our member care resource team for Vivem Europe. Hannes walked alongside so many missionaries over all the years, and he just carries so much insight and knowledge and wisdom, what is needed so that people on the missions field can not just survive, but that they can thrive. Mm. And Hannes has many gifts. One gift that I personally very much appreciate is his ability to put complex, important things into simple and words and, and into application. I know Hannes since a long time. I'm always learning something new from him. <laughs> so Hannes, thank you very much for making the effort to teach us today. Mm. Let me pray and then I hand it over to you. Okay. Father, thank you so much that you know us. Thank you that you called all of us to travel together to you and to be in missions. Father, thank you for the privilege to build your kingdom together with you. And Father, thank you that you so know, so well know what we need to be in the fullest and to thrive as we live, walk, work, and serve together with you, Father. And Father, mm -hmm. I pray that as Hannes is now sharing, translated it into our situations and into our context. Yeah. In Jesus' name I pray. Mm. Amen. Amen. Thomas, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, well, it's, it's so encouraging to see so many people from different countries, different agencies. Uh, I've been with YWAM, yeah, well over 30 years. Started my YWAM time in Hong Kong in Asia, doing the discipleship training school, met my wife in West Africa. And uh, then uh, we ended up for nine years in the UK and then nearly 10 years in Albania and uh, now 11 years uh, back in my home country, not my wife, so my ch children's real home country <laughs> uh, in Germany. And uh, I travel from here kind of. And uh, today, uh, my the notes that you got, and basically, I'm I'm sharing out of my my story, so you get to meet my family in some pictures and stuff, <laughs> as we cover the different phases and stages of of uh, yeah what missionaries go through. 
And um, for you, maybe you can um, listen sort of on two two levels. You know, one of course uh, for your own benefit, and and I hope uh, that there might be things where you go, oh yeah, that you know that's something what I share just connects with things that you have gone through, are going through. So that's the personal level, and then. Um, uh, for those uh, that are involved with personnel or member care or counseling or anything like that, listen with the other ear, like how, how, how can I apply this uh, in helping others? Yeah. And uh, today, I, I think I am a big picture person. And today, this is my day because you can't get much bigger than the whole life of a missionary <laughs> and uh, it I guess starts with people being called and uh, goes through you know our single years and then uh, before the field on the field and even retirement so it's it's the long view and uh, the goal I think for any missionary and people helping missionaries is that we run the race well and hopefully also finish it well and yeah so that's that's kind of what uh, we're doing today so my my personal subtitle is uh, adventure of a life and missions and uh, yeah that was africa in 19 91 i think <laughs> okay um this is an overview of all of the three days that we are uh doing and um so the three i think the three big phases in the life of a missionary is the preparation phase where you become aware of your calling and uh, you prepare um then comes the on-field phase uh, that we talk about today and then at some point a re-entry phase uh, of, of returning back home and uh, maybe even re-entering a normal life or retiring so those are the three big chunks that we will talk about in these three days today it's about the on-field phase and uh, yeah tomorrow you basically jump back and look at the preparation phase and then on Friday the re-entry as Heidi has has said yeah okay so the on-field phase in the middle here basically I I would think it starts with uh, yeah stepping out of the plane <laughs> and uh, initially there's this everything's new and uh, hopefully you get some sort of orientation we'll talk about that in more detail and then comes the whole phase of well everything is different and uh, all the adjustments we go through to to uh, yeah get used to our new surroundings and life and ministry and uh, then come the, the the longest phase the arrow is should be much longer it's the the, the ministry years um, that we have um, and uh, eventually uh, even the longest ministry years will come to a close either I mean we will have things like you know furlough maybe but also maybe going home permanently for various reasons so that's what we well, these four things we will look at today and uh, the prep and the re-entry will be covered tomorrow and on Friday. So, do you remember when in your missions uh, career you, you got off that plane or boat or train for the very first time and uh, what that was like? <laughs> um, the main thing I remember is uh, uh, I was on the, the YWAM ship, the Anastasis, for two years. And uh, I remember I joined the ship in London, took a train and uh, boat ride over to England. And I had 
lots of luggage and what didn't work out was the pickup at the train station so i had to somehow with four pieces of luggage make my way into the docklands in the east of london <laughs> trying to find that ship that wasn't the greatest uh, introduction <laughs> Um, afterwards, I met the people who said, yeah, we were stuck in traffic for an hour and a half. So there were reasons why I wasn't picked up. But uh, I think even that, or especially today with the young generation where first impressions are so important. Um, uh, yeah, uh, let's try to get that right, the, the, the pickup at the airport or wherever. <laughs> and um, then uh, yeah, there's different kinds of orientations that, that are helpful to people. Uh, one would be just as you arrive, uh, just that somebody hopefully is there who tells you the ropes of the, the country uh, and your location. Uh, just very practical stuff. Um, and uh, that just takes away a lot of the anxiety that is uh, that is there um, when we uh, first arrive in a place and everything's new and we have no clue we don't speak the language and somebody to hold our hand is, is extremely helpful and important and it reduces our stress levels i think and gives you a sense of security if you're not all on your own and um, yeah so i think that's that's vital i remember uh joining ywam albania with my uh, wife and two children our youngest was four weeks old when we arrived there in 2001 and uh, the first assignment i had after had having a little oral orientation was to rewrite the orientation handbook or staff manual because it still had all the things from 1997 which was a year of civil unrest in albania and uh, there were things in there like you know always drive in convoy keep the windows shut so nobody can toss a grenade in and uh, it didn't apply anymore four years later so we uh, that was my first task to rewrite basically my own orientation manual <laughs> but uh, actually it was quite helpful yeah so uh, hopefully you had that experience when you first uh, went to the field that somebody was there waiting for you at the airport step one and then just over the next days or or so uh, just to help you uh, get settled that that would be very good <laughs> if that happens um, and then of course hopefully you're uh, in the, the good position then to join a team that you're not on your own um, and uh, that also i think requires orientation like uh, maybe I, I hope you know before you join what the team is up to and uh, what kind of ministries uh, are are there also what sort of you know is it is it a, a work team or are you a community and then also the whole thing about what could be my role my job uh, sometimes this uh, is clear from the very outset you you join that team for that one specific role sometimes you arrive and it's not clear and uh, it might take some time to discover what your role could be and uh, hopefully again there's people that help you find your place in the team and in the ministry and uh, what is extremely helpful, I think, if the team uh, has the capacity or wisdom to, to when a new person joins, that you actually uh, do some team building together. And just, just to build that relationship, to get to know people, that just makes such a difference. And uh, then there's other orientations that uh, might happen at any time. Um, even if you've been there for quite a while, if you change roles uh, or if you return from a furlough or if the team has gone through a, a transition or a change, 
uh, that would require, uh, yeah, just new re reorientations kind of, uh, and that can happen actually many times. And it just makes life a little more predictable in maybe very new surroundings. So orientations, I think, are, are, are uh, vital. Right. Um, let's go into breakout rooms. And uh, if you've printed out your little note, my field notes, actually, you have what I have. This is my own kind of, I'm talking of these. <laughs> And but I made extra lines so you can write your own things in between uh, if you hear something that you want to write down. And uh, now uh, I give you 10 minutes in a breakout group and I want you to uh, discuss um, maybe from your own personal good or not so good experiences the first week after a new staff person, let's say, joins your team, how can you help this new missionary arrive and settle in well? Just uh, brainstorm, you share your stories, uh, do's and don'ts or whatever. So, yes. So, um, did it all come back to you your first time off the plane or wherever and <laughs> um, actually why, why don't we just uh, if, if you have something that uh, that you experienced or that you feel this is a good way to help new people when they just arrived uh, just just uh, maybe wave and to start talking <laughs> hmm. I was going to say I had the same experience you had, exactly the same, arriving with three suitcases uh, and no wheels on the suitcases. And I have decided when I get to heaven, I'm going to try and find the person who invented the wheels on the suitcases. <laughs> I want to thank him. <laughs> but I also had a magnificent uh, time the first time I joined YOM in another base and it was community living and they were absolutely totally welcoming immediately. Mm. And, uh, and I think the community living made a difference. Mm -hmm. as you start off in missions mm -hmm. because yes. you meet the people you see the people you eat with them and then you get advice yes. as opposed to being stuck into a new apartment by yourself to start off with that's right so, that's right yeah. yes thank you yes yeah. any other stories or or ideas of how to help that young usually young person that's just arrived. Uh, I think there's a lot, there's a big difference now with the younger generation um, that is coming in that have different expectations, different needs mm. um, than previous generations. So I think it's super helpful to understand the differences mm. between those generations and to even ask people, you know, hey, what what do you need? Like, of course, having a plan is helpful, um, and just checking in with people as well, and and giving that time and that grace, and not just jumping into, you know, a million ministries and things like that. But working with the person to see, you know, some people need to go go go. Some people need a little bit of space. I think that's helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, it's me. And now we have mobile phones. So when we get stuck at the airport or station, we can call and we have uh, Google. We can do the GPS to find our way. So life is easier now than it was. True. Very true. Last century. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. Carl? It's anything? not like in the old days. When, when I went to Congo 1982, uh, the message home that we arrived safely took six weeks. Oh, yeah. yeah, maybe maybe you'll cover this. One of the challenges, besides just the intergenerational thing with the, the Gen Zers coming out now, mm -hmm. is there's you can look in, and kind of do like everything for them and, and have everything served on a plate, or you can have nothing and mm -hmm. they have to figure it out. Mm -hmm. and, and so how do you, you know, somewhere in between is probably the right thing to do. And um, so to to maybe talk about that a little bit yeah. um, would be helpful. Yeah. Yes, yes. 
because our, mean, our first field, our first field was we were mid career already. So we weren't young, mm -hmm. but we arrived at the airport with our children who were middle school and primary school age. And uh, we had, of course, our 12 allowed suitcases, plus a, a, a crate with a Labrador retriever. Um, and, and, and we shoved everything into two small European vehicles on the way to stay at the pastor's mother-in-law's house for a few days until <laughs> we could find an apartment somewhere. <laughs> yes. And we knew we were on our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Any, any ideas to Carl's question? Like, yeah, do we mother them and pamper them or do we give them a first taste of what it's really like in missions by mm. not doing that. What's a good mix? Any experiences? We have found that mentorship is actually a great strategy. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not that everything's handed to you, but that each person knows the person that they can ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a balance so that um, because if you do everything for them, they may need that for the first couple of weeks, but after that to step back and, but yet still have that connection, that relationship so that they can um, yeah. connect when they have questions about right. their new culture. I think it's important to note that like in our older generations, a lot of us did have to just jump in and sink or swim but that's not to say that that is the best way to do it. Yeah. So to actually prevent that as much as we can to keep people healthy and whole and motivated and everything, like Kara said, mentorship and all of that kind of stuff. It's not like, ah, oh, just suck it up and deal with it. Like you're gonna have to, like, how do we actually help people stay healthy on the mission field by starting out well? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would uh, agree with Cora that I think it's, uh really good to have that kind of mentorship or like especially for people who come single by themselves mm -hmm. to have someone telling them okay whatever it is you know mm -hmm. just call me or whatever and i'll help you mm -hmm. uh, i think especially for people who come alone if, if you come as a family or a couple at least then you have someone to you know bounce questions with but mm -hmm. uh, especially for people who come single i think that's really important mm -hmm. yeah Yep. Normally for the first few days, we will, you know, uh, bring them around, bring them shopping, mm -hmm. and show them a bit of the surrounding, mm -hmm. but then we will normally uh, tell them who they can go to, mm -hmm. or maybe we will tell them which day, um, the, I, I used to stay on a mission base, so we were like a community, you see, and then we have some days that we go shopping and, you know, we do some activities together. So what we will normally do, we will tell the newcomer, like, which day we are going to do shopping and uh, just so that he or she can get used to, to the new surrounding. And then, you know, thereafter, maybe in a month or so, he or she won't need us, you know, yeah. and we will also show the person uh, you know, where he can find uh, transportation, just so if uh, he or she wants to go uh, by themselves uh, in uh, a couple of weeks, let's say, they can do so. Yeah, but for the first week, we will normally guide them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yes. I think designating, designating like uh, this is your point person. Yeah. And just mm -hmm. if you are a team, just really welcoming them in and maybe interrupting your normal weekly ministry mm -hmm. schedule just to make them feel welcome. I think that's, that right. sounds good. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, any, any other uh, comments on those crucial first few days or the first few, you know, week or some weeks? Uh, any gems that you've discovered or you wished you <laughs> would have had? <laughs> Sorry, that's me again, but just a thought, the language issue. I've noticed when new people come, when they speak the language, they are so much more independent. You don't have to explain things to them. They can ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so the, the way you treat a non, someone who doesn't mm -hmm. speak the language is different. I mean, yes. I guess you all know that. Thank you. Yeah, very true. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, not speaking the language just increases the stress levels yeah. Uh, hugely. Yeah, mm -hmm. because you're not sure what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've covered orientations. And um, that's me uh, in West Africa. <laughs> Very fresh on the field. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit about the adjustment process that we go through when we arrive on the field. Um, as be, as we prepare to uh, to go, uh, the excitement and anticipation is rising, and we're you know the feels great and uh, the adventure before us and stuff. And usually. When we arrive, we arrive on an emotional high, kind of, it's that adventure thing. And uh, the first few weeks, uh, possibly months, but uh, sometimes only days, <laughs> is what uh, is called the honeymoon phase. And maybe you remember when it was your first time overseas and it was just exotic and amazing. And uh, uh, everything's new, everything's different, and everything's exciting. But within a certain amount of time, suddenly things uh, that were exciting uh, become annoying, and uh, you're sliding down into, well, it's not, yeah, it's not always a culture shock, but definitely culture stress. And uh, it's very hard to put real figures to it, but usually when you have somebody come to you and share with you kind of like, I am fed up, I'm thinking about going home, I, the, the, the locals annoy me, I hate the food. And if you ask, how long have you been here? It's usually six months and then you know, yep, they're in the depths of that culture crisis uh, uh, that's, or the culture stress, culture shock. And it's usually good, a good thing to encourage them to stick it out just a little longer before booking their flight home, <laughs> because it will improve again. And uh, that's what we what we will talk about now is this whole uh, phase of cultural or just well, not just cultural adjustments, adjusting to our new location, the people, everything. And uh, Usually, I think after maybe a year or, or so, you are in the adaptation phase and, and your level of functioning, your emotional balance is uh, not quite where it was during the honeymoon phase, but, but back to normal or so. But of course, that can vary tremendously. You know, some people uh, just plunge into culture shock instantly and uh, uh, or others it takes them many years to really adapt uh, but this is sort of a generalized uh, uh, graph how it goes kind of so six three six nine months that yeah that's usually not so easy but um, yeah so that's that's uh, cultural adjustments and there are many adjustments just uh, thinking about culture um, when you arrive, all the different, I mean, all our bearings are lost and, and we don't know what's appropriate, what, what, you know, the do's and the don'ts, you know, is it okay to hold hands with my wife when I walk outside or not? And all the different customs and I remember uh, we we had just arrived in Albania and uh, suddenly somebody in the neighborhood uh, uh, died and we were clueless and fortunately we could just call uh, an experienced missionary and ask him, what 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 do we do what are the expectations of us and and he told us how to do the condolences in Albanian to say the Turoni Vet and Gujelime, uh, <laughs> just the little words that that you say. And and he says, yeah, no, just go there and 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 be there. No, you don't because you don't have to kiss the corpse in the open coffin in the living room. It's okay. Don't do that. <laughs> so it was just so helpful to know roughly what to do. 
and uh, so that yeah there's of course i think that's what hits you first is is everything so different and uh, i think it's a little harder for the perfectionists among us uh, because i mean mistakes are guaranteed and they're normal and the sooner we learn to laugh at ourselves and and take things with a portion of humor uh, the better ideally uh, when we are still in that high phase of the, the the honeymoon phase if we can use that time to bond actually with the local people and not just hang out with the uh, foreigners or uh, the expats on on our team uh, or only stay in the mission compound or so it really makes a difference long term for instance we we arrived with a two-year-old and a four-week-old and uh, we uh, we actually stay wait sorry no my daughter wasn't born yet it was just my son two years old into everything and we decided we want to stay for the first couple of weeks with a an Albanian family so we did and uh, well that was definitely <laughs> full immersion into the culture and uh, uh, just funny little things, you know, my, my wife would brush our son's teeth that, uh, and, and they would ask, what are you doing? And she said, I'm brushing his teeth, but they're milk teeth. They will just fall out anyway. And a week later, guess what was in the bathroom? They all had toothbrushes. <laughs> so it was little things like that. Uh, but it helped uh, to, to realize they don't bite, you know, we don't, we can hardly communicate, but, uh, but something happened there and that was really good. And the same would go for language. Um, uh, I, I think this immersion thing, just, just being with the people, trying out little phrases uh, is, is very helpful. There is a book called LAMP, Language Acquisition Made Practical. Uh, if you're an extrovert, this is your dream come true. You learn one phrase in the morning and then you go out and practice it with every person you bump into when you go shopping in the market or wherever. And you meet people and you learn the language. So, um, yeah. And actually we negotiated uh, with our team leader. We want a year, the first year, no ministry, but just we want to learn the language and learn the culture. And because they wanted us there, they agreed. So that was, that was good. So that would be cultural adjustments. And there's lots more, of course, to say on that. Then physical, of course, depending on where you go, the first thing you might notice is the heat or the cold, you know, depending whether you go to Africa or Russia. Um, and uh, the whole thing about water, you know, can you drink it? Usually not. Or maybe you've never experienced the uh, uh, electricity going off and there it happens every day. Or uh, often you don't have a, the, a car available maybe and you realize you're doing a lot of walking and the bugs are there and annoying and of course the food is all different and hard, maybe it's hard to find your comfort foods from home. In the early days in Albania, uh, they no supermarkets and in the missionary community, if somebody would stumble across something like cornflakes at some corner store, that news would go wild and you had to go there quick before they sold out because then they were gone again. <laughs> and uh, or the classic question with the toilets, where does the toilet paper go in or into the little basket <laughs> and uh, things like that or just cleanliness it might be very different from home or accommodations, sharing a room uh, with others. I mean, just the physical things can be uh, quite stressful initially and takes a lot of adjusting. Um, social, initially, of course, 
you don't know anyone. And I love it, Christina, that you what you said about uh, taking them in and, and taking them round and involving them and, you know, feeding them. And I think that is such a good way of uh, helping them feel a little welcome at first when they know nobody. And uh, of course, our families usually are far away or uh, um, and uh, or things like, yeah, the roles of men, women, uh, how to interact. Is it OK to look somebody in, in the face or that's a no, no? Um, and maybe you start longing for your home church and you go to church, but you don't understand the word. So that that can be hard socially. And because of all those changes and adjustment emotionally, it's a tough time. It's a time of high stress. And uh, maybe if you go as a couple, husbands and wives, suddenly there's conflict because the stress needs to come out somewhere. Or if you come arrive as a single, loneliness might be there, or just anxiety um, or excitement. But yeah, it's easy to feel insecure or homesick. Um, then uh, politically, uh, maybe depending on what home country you come from, uh, corruption might be a new thing for you. Uh, people expecting little bribes to do the most basic things for you. And uh, maybe telling people uh, especially young people, be slow to form uh, an opinion and even slower to voice that opinion about how the political system works, because we are guests in, in, in the, that country and uh, we can either offend or get into trouble by speaking, you know, too freely, too quickly. So tread carefully. Uh, that's something I would maybe tell somebody who's just arrived. Then. Uh, spiritual adjustments uh yeah like often there is a, just a different spiritual climate in the country you arrive to from where you come from uh, for instance in albania uh, there's this spirit of hopelessness over the whole nation kind of um and and that can really get to you after a while and um uh, just practical things like, you know, if you're at a YWAM base or maybe with an OM team too, there's hardly any room to really be on your own for your quiet time. And maybe that's what you're used to from home. Um, and just maintaining your spiritual disciplines might be a lot harder. Also being exposed to suffering, maybe for the first time for people and I think often people come with a level of um, spiritual naivety, kind of like, well, I'm doing God's work and so he will protect me, full stop. And reality is different. We live in a fallen world uh, and things don't always go so easy and so smooth. And uh, I mean, Jesus says it all when he says, uh, you know, in this world, you will have trouble. <laughs> no kidding. Um, I remember as a member care worker uh, 15 or so years ago in Albania, one of the YWAMers came to me and he, he said, Hannes, I just feel so dry. And at that point, I did not know how to, what to tell him kind of, you know, I, I realized that, well, just read your Bible more or pray harder, that didn't cut it, but I had nothing in my own repertoire kind of where I could tell him, you know, this is how you could refresh. Fortunately, I've learned a few things in the last 15 years, so I would treat that differently today. But yeah, so those might be spiritual things that are going on. Uh, if it's your first time on the field, finances and living by faith uh, might be very challenging, very stressful initially. Maybe you're still working on raising support and 
newsletter writing is a new thing for you and you might be on a tight budget. And um, I remember my children when they're a bit older, they were confused. You know, we, we went between, you know, furlough in Germany or Switzerland where my wife's from in Albania. And they would ask us, Daddy, are we poor when we were in Switzerland? And then in Albania, it was kind of the other, Daddy, are we rich? And by comparison, yes and yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, th those are things or just practical how to deal with beggars uh, uh, that that come to your door other that you meet in the streets and how do how can I be Jesus to them without being just shamelessly exploited <laughs> so yeah all questions that are uh, that de demand adjustment and I think we can be a big help to people just sharing from our experiences our own personal identity uh if i especially if i don't speak the language initially suddenly i'm back to childhood level i know nothing and 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 that might feel very uncomfortable you know if we especially if we derive our identity from our performance and we are back to square one because we don't know anything that might be feel threatening for a while. I remember uh, the same senior missionary in Albania that helped us with the burial customs. He shared with us when he was brand new, he was really down in the dumps about the language learning. He really struggled with it and he was out walking and there was this dog lying in the street. And then an Albanian came by and yelled at the dog something that he didn't understand but the dog got up and moved away and to him it's like man even the dog understands albanian and i don't so i think we can help people and you know just encourage them that this is a normal phase to go through that we feel useless uh because we yeah we we don't know how things work yet or i don't know if you i i remember in africa you you go to a church service uh, and you just would be very happy to sit in the last row and just observe and then you get dragged up front either into the first row or straight onto the podium next to the pulpit just because you're white uh, or a foreigner uh, and that feels very awkward so identity can be uh, an interesting one and below all this that's where the true values are, are hidden, cultural values, for instance. Uh, we might observe customs that are very different from ours, but we have no idea why they do what they do. Um, and it takes quite a while to unearth uh, the real reasons behind certain things. And probably for me, the biggest one is, you know, if you are, we, I come from a very individual, individualistic culture in, in Europe and Germany. And if you're then in a nation or in a people group where it's a group culture and group decision making, that's uh, very confusing at first because it, it's so, yeah, just strange, foreign. And to realize that we all probably without realizing carry within us a, quite a bit of ethnocentrism, meaning like, well, my values are better, <laughs> which is not true. <laughs> yeah. And in all this, um, uh, I think the most helpful support to a new missionary can be a local friend. Uh, it was quite quite nice when we were sent out from uh, oops from ywm england uh, a lady there had a word for us uh, and she said you will meet you will meet someone who will become a, a helper and a friend and within a few weeks of arriving uh, we we were recommended a, a, a lady as a cleaning lady but within a short time, she was our best friend and she looked after the kids and stuff. And uh, she was priceless in explaining some of the Albanian culture things to us. And we dared to ask her the 
the touchy questions that you couldn't really ask in public or so. So that can be very helpful. Or another missionary, like when you have little kids and maybe find another missionary mom with children, same age, they who've been there a longer time, that can be so helpful. And of course, you as a member care worker can be that help too. <laughs> if you've been there a while, then uh, that can be really good uh, that you, you are that source of information to, uh, to people. Right, I've been talking a lot. Now it's your turn again. We'll send you into breakout rooms and uh, you get 15 minutes uh, to talk about how can we help new missionaries to adjust to the life on uh, life on the field and just share from your own personal experiences and just brainstorm together what uh, practical make it really practical what what kind of things would be helpful welcome back um maybe let's use the the chat function at the bottom there uh, and you can just type into the chat any any uh, things that you came up with uh, with uh, what would be helpful to help new missionaries actually through that adjustment process which can take months and years and uh, i don't know if you had things for the different uh, different categories, I mean, cultural, physical, social, emotional, spiritual. Um, Alexandra just shared that for her as a Brazilian to be in Latvia, uh, physically, just it's cold there. And that was a real uh, challenge, kind of. And uh, so what was the other thing you mentioned, Alexandra, about member care and what's different yeah it's more difficult uh, as a brazilian here talking about the feelings because they don't are so open to share it's more introvert introvert country than mine it's more easy to brazilians talking about these things mm -hmm. yeah yeah okay so any, anything that you came up with in your breakout groups, just uh, type it in the chat, maybe. Heidi, can you read it to us? Mm -hmm. So how to get around in the city, safely around. Mm -hmm. um, another comment is have resources about the culture to send before arrival. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Learning the language makes all the difference in the world and showing people where the dollar store is. Where do I get the baskets? I <laughs> <laughs> am question. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. True. Thank you. Hmm. Anything else that makes life adjustment easier for newbies? <laughs> That's what I experienced with a couple from out from New Zealand. It they said it would have helped them to know the speed limits before they got the bill <gasps> on the highway. <laughs> and mm. other that came in assigned challenges. To go outside the iron bubble and into the culture, pair up with an experienced body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. And it's good to use the honeymoon phase for that. Uh, I think in the first few days and weeks, uh, it, it really, that can make such a difference when they realize, oh, this is fun to be out and with somebody who knows how it goes and then it's much easier to uh, i've met people who didn't have that and even years later they were hesitant about being outside on their own yeah 
Um, another one, sharing about the do's and the don'ts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Normalizing. Telling new missionaries that it is normal to feel frustrated with language or culture at a certain stage. Mm -hmm. Not to feel guilty if it takes longer than they expected. Yes. Yeah. So true. Mm -hmm. um, Chen said in particular loves lots of info. So making sure to be, to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember Generation Z. When are they born? I don't remember those years. So they are typically the oldest are about twenty five, and the youngest I think is ten. And then you start Generation Alpha after that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here came a new one: a welcome guidebook for the team mm -hmm. and area. Sitting with them and reading it to make sure they understand it. That's good. Especially the second part, because it doesn't feel nice, you know, here you go, that's all you need to know. And I'm, all, you know, uh, to go through them together with it together. That's I like that. Yes. <laughs> now, it takes work to write one and to keep it updated, uh, but it's worth it, I think. Yeah. Anything else that came up in your groups that you want to uh, bless us with? <laughs> homestay for um, encouraging um, newcomers to develop friendship with the locals to uh, language acquisition and culture. Mm -hmm. We uh, look for host family to host them, um, trusted or mm -hmm. known people in the community for them to have a safe environment to learn. Mm -hmm. The language and culture yes and, uh, dynamic which uh -huh. you couldn't you wouldn't have that in a expert community that's right that's right thank you leo yes absolutely and if you can pick the host family and you know they're safe and good people uh uh very good yeah yeah one more, a bunch of business cards to show taxi drivers to get to very useful places. <laughs> mm -hmm. True. <laughs> Hannes, do you want to share a few words about the handouts that you provided about the culture adjustment and the cultural mm -hmm. assessment form? Yeah. Um, there is a little questionnaire about culture stress. Uh, that you could give to a newcomer after some weeks or some months or when you notice maybe that they're struggling and uh, that can quickly show you uh, uh, where the person is at and also it also normalizes it for them because if they recognize themselves in the questions they realize I'm not the only one that's going through this process uh, no matter how bad it feels and uh, also uh, just to have in the back of your mind this yellow adjustment curve that i showed on the powerpoint the blue background just that expect that dip after half a year or so we talked with alexandra and i asked her because she's in latvia now for six months so i was curious where are you on the curve and it was encouraging to hear that she feels she's on the upswing <laughs> so yeah so th those are things you can use uh, also to quickly assess how somebody's doing and it gives you a good springboard just to talk uh, and and share and uh, maybe help with you know when you see uh, you know how they answered you, uh, you know uh, it gives you a good uh, door to to maybe talk about special specific issues or so with people right we are now going from adjustment to um, the normal ministry years i mean normal is always relative of course but um, and uh, what we found over the last oh, years or so is is uh, the whole thing about managing our stress uh, that that is is a 
a major um, thing that we need to learn how to do. The ministry years, yes. So here we are. Stress. Oh, don't we love it? I don't know. I, are you familiar with the so-called stress curve or stress chart? It's uh, um, on the left hand side is, is our output, our ability, and uh, at the horizontal is, is kind of the pressure or demand or busyness. And uh, if we start on the left hand side, uh, it's when we have no not nothing or not, not enough to do, kind of there's boredom and uh, under involvement or even rust out and frustration because I feel useless. And then we go up the curve um, and become more stimulated and alert and creative and actually effective. And then at the top is, is the optimum. And don't you wish we would always be there? But usually that's a difficult place to stay. <laughs> And uh, if the, the stress levels in, keep increasing, the demands placed on us, then mm -hmm. our, if, our efficiency actually gets reduced. Um, and uh, we feel overloaded and even alertness is, is uh, reduced and, and concentration suffers. And if we keep going up, uh, we become irritable and indecisive, anxiety grows and uh, at a certain point, uh, it actually is replaced by confusion and just fatigue, which leads, if it still doesn't stop, uh, to exhaustion and finally to burnout. That's that's the stress curve or stress chart. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just good to know um, what's what's going on. How can we, on a personal level, uh, deal with this and how can we help others to deal with with this um, in general missionaries are uh, experiencing higher levels of stress compared to the normal population there are these uh, um, questionnaires that help you look at the last year of your life and if you've had major stressors like uh, uh, the death of a spouse or you know uh, things and it's all different numbers if you add them up they say if you hit 200 points uh, then you're in a danger area and that's for normal population if missionaries take the same test they often hit 600 points or more so we are dealing with uh, um, just a different dimension of stress compared to people back home um, and that's important to know because otherwise uh, yeah uh, and so we can uh, deal with it um, yeah well babies can be stressful too <laughs> As nice as they are, that's my family 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, work-life work, work -life balance uh, is, is uh, uh, an important thing, uh, kind of, especially in missions where we feel, well, we're responsible to our, our supporters, or we feel, well, God told me to do this, so we, we give it our best. Uh, but often then it becomes, you know, do we turn into workaholics? Uh, that could happen. Um, and uh, in our team meetings or so, uh, what do we talk about? You know, work usually. And uh, to find things outside of your, your ministry uh, that gives you life. I think that's, that's important. And it starts with biblical things like taking a Sabbath rest. It may not be on the Sunday because Sunday might be your busiest day if you're a church planter, um, but take another day during the week that is your day off. Um, that's important. And uh, maybe even with our little tea break right now, we try to model something. Uh, just, yeah, 
put a, put breaks into your day. Encourage other people to do that. Uh, don't have your coffee break in, you know, don't get the coffee and sit back in front of your computer or don't have your lunch break in front of your computer, but actually change of scenery. <laughs> uh, it starts with little things like that. And uh, yeah, daily breaks, the weekly Sabbath and hopefully annually uh, some sort of holiday. And uh, it's interesting in the sort of many of the post-communist countries, the, the idea of holiday is is a, a difficult topic. They're not used to that, and and to model it, to encourage it, uh, it's it's quite a challenge to do that. And uh, by the way, a furlough uh, and visiting supporters is not a holiday, <laughs> as you may have discovered yourself. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, that's uh, yeah that's important and also to go through um if you've experienced uh, especially stressful things it's good to to do a, maybe even an informal debriefing just share with somebody who understands um and just to get it out it, it's so helpful and if you're a member care worker you can be that other person that takes notice Oh, so and so has just come back from outreach, leading an outreach, or or even just ministry somewhere, and uh, just to take the time and say, "Hey, how was it? Let's let, come on, let's grab a cup of something and uh, let's let's talk." If, uh, and so you you can be that that sounding board where people can just share the good and the bad, whatever they experienced. Um, yeah and uh, maybe back to the the furlough and uh, uh fundraising is not a holiday to plan in from the beginning uh maybe when you arrive back home uh for your whatever one two three months or whatever you have maybe that first week don't even tell people you're in country uh hopefully you know pray ask Maybe somebody can give you a, you know, a little holiday place or something. And for the first week or at least sometime during your furlough, that you actually have a holiday, you know, because, uh, yeah, it's crucial. Um, otherwise, we return to the field more stressed than when we, when we went home. <laughs> yeah. So stress is, is, is a big one. And uh, there are other... I, I gave you the cross-cultural stress and adjustment uh, questionnaire. There's lots of these little self-test, self-questionnaires that you can just... Uh, I have a whole collection of different ones. And uh, if you just give that to somebody where you wonder <laughs> where they are, uh, and they fill it out, and then you can talk about it. Uh, uh, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to be the expert. You just need to know where to, you know, find it. <laughs> right. So dealing with stress, I think, is one of the main things. So many people delay that and you hear, yeah, yeah, I know I'm stressed and I know I'm not coping well, but I'll do a sabbatical in two years. That's not a good way of dealing with it. Um, daily, weekly, annually. Yeah. Okay. So next source of joy and frustration is team life <clears throat> and our relationships in our teams. Um, yeah, it, it can be so wonderful and it can be so also frustrating or stressful, um, especially if I think if you're a cross-cultural team, it's much harder to uh, because there's countless opportunities for misunderstandings nobody means bad but somehow it just all gets muddled um, so if things go wrong uh, keep short accounts uh, i'm always very saddened when i you know when you get called in to do like a mediation because the team uh, is you know there's a little thing has just grown and grown because it hasn't been addressed that that's really sad uh 
when it happens. And uh, it's, it's good to ask for, for outside uh, help in, in, in a conflict or so um, early on, if you can, before things got so toxic that there's no way besides kind of leaving or so that uh, that makes me really sad especially if it you realize it's preventable and as a team there's lots of stuff you can do besides work together uh, you can do cross-cultural team building things and just do fun things together eat celebrate you know anything what i loved about albania is they have a uh, a Muslim majority, but also Roman Catholics and uh, Greek Orthodox uh, populations. So, man, we got holidays galore. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so use them, use them to celebrate. Uh, and and, and uh, especially, I think, eating together uh, really helps you bond as a team. It's easy after a couple of years when you got your adjustment and your adaptation down, you know the language, the ministry is going well and you're just flowing, that we sort of start to plateau. Uh, I noticed that in my, my language ability uh, in Albanian, I was fine with uh, the shopping and the car mechanic and these sort of things, but uh, yeah, you kind of tend to stay at the level that you need. And, and I think anything like, uh, yeah, make sure that you keep developing, self-development, like just by reading. I love reading, I love real books, <laughs> but whatever works for you, um, that we get input that our, our minds are stimulated. And of course, there's lots of stuff you can do online by now um many free things especially with the ukraine conflict suddenly resources that used to be really expensive are offered for free um, or go to seminars and well i'm preaching to the choir here because you're here you're doing a seminar great <laughs> yeah so that's that's one thing that i think is helpful to keep learning lifelong learners um then, yeah, if you are a member care worker or in leadership or in pastoral care, uh, just to check in with people how they're doing. Um, it's not an, it can be a touchy topic. Uh, we try to introduce an annual uh, review or checkup in, in, uh, to YWAM in Albania. Uh, and we were fairly naive and surprised by the fairly strong anti-reaction until we realized that that just smacks of communist interrogation kind of and and we have the dossier on you and uh, we're going to use it against you all so there was a cultural barrier and we actually did not succeed in, in putting that into place regularly which is sad because uh, many people that have experienced it say, actually, this is so encouraging to look back after it. Yeah, look at all the things I did accomplish. So it can be a time of celebrating and maybe a time of goal setting for the future. Uh, if it happens, I think it's a wonderful thing. It may be good if it's an outside person, maybe not from your organization to do that. Um, also, what <clears throat> is available is uh, it's called a 360 review, which would be uh, a, a, like a team evaluation that your peers and your uh, supervisor and maybe people under you anonymously kind of uh, fill out some questionnaires. And that can also be quite encouraging, actually. Uh, yeah, it, it's sort of initially scary because you i don't know if it's human nature but we oh no they're going to say bad things about me but if if it happens and if it's done right it's actually very encouraging then um managing your um uh, i would call it public identity uh in many countries that are 
creative access, re restricted access by now, uh, you need a, a, a believable, a viable public identity because people will ask the question, why are you here? And I remember uh, <clears throat> in our early days in Albania, some Albanian guys would say, well, gosh, you must you must get super fat salaries from your your company that you come to a tough place like Albania. And when we said, well, <laughs> actually, we don't get any salary in their normal sense. Uh, they were completely confused and even suspicious, kind of like, you know, <laughs> Uh, so that's that's important to come up with something that works in your context there. And of course, nowadays with uh, Facebook and other social media platforms, you have to just be very careful uh, what you do, what you write, because you, you know, unless you know exactly how to uh, shut things down, you don't know who's going to read this and it might endanger yourself or other people. Um, so that's a, a big thing uh, to to be careful about and knowledgeable. Ideally appoint like a, a person in your team who knows about these sort of things. Um, yeah, we've had a few scary moments in the last uh, seven months where people posted things on Facebook that should not have been posted. <laughs> Um, because you don't know who's going to read them. Then crisis things, we all pray and hope they don't happen, but are we prepared if they happen? Um, it might be something, well, I, I say minor to my children. It was not minor when a hamster died in Albania. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it might be that or a natural disaster. We've had earthquakes down there, civil unrest. And of course, now with the Ukraine uh, war, this is a completely, it, it's gone to a new level. Um, or people might get sick on your team. Accidents might happen. So there are things, and uh, I mean, that could be a whole another teaching that we actually have. Uh, it's called, <laughs> you know, preparedness for crisis. Uh, but especially as a member care person, it's good to have something, you know, be aware. Yeah, bad things can happen to good people because we live in a world that is in conflict. Um, yeah. Then uh, you may have arrived on the field as a single uh, and maybe you're still single or you may have met someone on the field or off the field and you're married. Um, that is, yeah, that changes things quite a bit. Um, and especially then I think the challenge of cross-cultural marriages uh, is, is um, there um, and I'm usually cautious when people come and say, "Yeah, um, I want to marry somebody from a totally other culture." Wow, yeah, uh, it's not; it's just not easy. And and then this whole thing of uh, single people in a team feeling left out because the families might invite each other. Uh, and the kids might play and the singles, I mean, one sentence that I still have in my mind is, don't just call me when you need a babysitter, you know, uh, and, and the first few times might be fine, but if that's all, then mm, it's not so good. And uh, yeah, and could be also a good, good, you know, the, fortunately by now there are, you know, retreats or seminars or, or things, uh, you know, for single missionaries, uh, you can go to, to places and, and there are things that are happening, uh, which I think is good. And um, yeah, as a married couple or even newly married couple in a, in a different culture that poses its own stresses and and uh, yeah often people don't understand privacy and don't understand that you have maybe a higher need 
for time, the two of you or so, uh, that can be tricky. Um, yeah, I remember, uh, wasn't me, but somebody sharing uh, in, in a setting where they were in a, in a village and people just would, you know, shop, show up on their doorstep any time of day. So once a week, they would uh, lock the front door, leave through the back door. <laughs> And just just to have some time on on, on or, or or stay in the house kind of but but not answer, uh, you need to be creative I think, yeah, and then you saw my family already when children arrive, uh, I think a, a clock starts ticking with the birth of your first child, the first five or six years are usually fairly easy, uh, but then the whole issue of schooling comes in and that's a decision time. You know, are you into homeschooling? Is there a local school uh, in the local language or is there maybe an English language school or even an international school where you are? Or what about uh, sending children to boarding school? And uh, my wife uh, was at the airport in Guinea Conakry, seeing how uh, like a six or seven year old was, you know, boarding a plane to go to another country for boarding school and the tears uh, on both sides and how it, uh, yeah, and she vowed, I will never do that to my children. And it depends, of course, with some agency, you basically sign beforehand that that's that's the plan. In YWAM, we have the freedom to make our own decisions there. But yeah, it's 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 tricky, tricky situations. And uh, I don't know, are you familiar with the term uh, TCK, third culture kid? And it used to be called missionary kids, but now they realize that it's not just missionaries. We've become so mobile that uh, 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 worldwide, globally, that this is not just referring to missionaries anymore. And they do grow up between cultures and uh, uh, form their own culture, which is neither the parents' passport culture nor completely the culture of their host country where the family is in ministry. And uh, they don't feel at home 100% where maybe the parents feel at home and they they're not a hundred percent at home even in the country they've grown up or yeah so um there's a nice way of actually demonstrating that to children is uh, if you mix up a little yellow water and blue water and say okay this yellow water that's your home country where your parents come from and the blue that's where you're living now but when you pour the two together, it, a third thing happens, it's green. And you're not yellow and you're not blue, but you're kind of both. both. Uh, and that can be helpful for even for children to understand. Um, it's worth as to encourage parents to deal with that or uh, uh, read up on it early on. When the children are little, it's easy to ignore because home is where mommy is. But we've, I've heard this sad story about somebody who's been like really in, in, in the bush and the children grew up in a tribal area. And uh, the mother said, yeah, yeah, I have this. Wait, I can show you. Let me stop sharing screen briefly. Okay, yeah, I, ha I have this book uh, about third culture kids, but reading it made me so sad. So I stopped reading it. Well, their children were 16 and showing serious signs of social maladjustment, kind of like, uh, you know, and she was just basically, let's ignore the problem. <laughs> uh, not a good way to do that. Uh, so this is a good book. It's on at the bottom of your sheet. I have a little bit, little bit of a reading list there. So this is a good book uh, to, with, uh, with children, Ruth Van Rieken and uh, David Pollock. While I'm at books, uh, 
Before kid, uh, uh, people go out, this is a wonderful book about, uh, well, it's not fundraising. They call it friend raising because friends stick with you <laughs> uh, by Betty Barnett. You don't need to write it down. It's on your sheet. This uh, I could imagine that Ryan talks about this tomorrow because that's important before people go to the field. <laughs> and third book about... Uh, Foreign to Familiar by Sarah Lanier, um, a really good help for cultural adjustment. It talks about hot climate cultures, you know, like all extrovert and group and then cold climate cultures. Yeah, very helpful. So those, those are some, some books I can recommend. Okay. Yes, Family and TCKs. So if you're a member care person or a parent, uh, I encourage you to not ignore this until it's uh, it already sort of the damage is, is being seen kind of. But uh, I think it's a privilege to grow up in se uh, several cultures. And uh, if things go well, these kids are amazing uh, in their uh, way, uh, ability to connect with people of all cultures. Um, so it, I think it's a privilege, but it also has its downfalls. Like my daughter just hates farewells. She just too many have happened. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What comes next? Um, Okay, sorry, I missed one, uh, the whole uh, side of spirituality. As I mentioned 15 years ago, I didn't know what to tell the guy who said, I feel so dry. Um, I, 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 yeah, I was struggling myself at that point with this. So um, I think a key is how to stay close to Jesus. Uh, Anything that helps, I think, is 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 good. And uh, one possibility, and and many people say that this was a lifesaver, is a prayer partnership. Just find find someone that you can maybe on a weekly basis just meet and pray together, share and pray for each other. I think that can be such a strengthening of your walk with the Lord. And. Uh, I've discovered that spiritual disciplines, they're not, oh no, I need to do that too? On top of everything else, I'm already stressed. I've actually discovered the beauty of them and that they actually help me to slow down and to reconnect with God on a different level. So maybe it's an age thing too. Maybe as a 25 year old, you're just not patient enough. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and what we can do as member care or or pastoral people or so is um, maybe organize retreats you know where you can it's not a holiday you come to meet with god and you know two three three nights somewhere uh, that can be really refreshing maybe your home church can offer something like that or uh, other organizations in the area where you work uh, maybe they have something it's worth uh, pursuing because, I mean, what could be more sad than, you know, serving uh, people, ministering for the Lord and, and along the way kind of losing your own relationship with the Lord or just, just becoming so dry and fried. That would be really sad. I think we can only give what we have. Is my, if my tank is empty, what can I give? And I've been there. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. But, okay, this is in the middle is my kids. Uh, oh, gosh, that's 10 years ago. The, ben, the, and the gray one, he's married since this summer and lives in Vancouver, Canada. And in the red sweater, the, that's Hannah, and she just started university. And on the sides are our friend's kids. And look at all the countries they represent. That's, you know, birth countries and where they grow up and <laughs> where parents were born. So it's, it's a special mix uh, for third culture kids. 
Don't ask them where, where they're from. They hate that question. <laughs> okay. What we've discovered to be very helpful in ministering to uh, our missionary colleagues uh, is, is uh, this thing. It's called the seven S of member care. And this little cake, we start from the bottom uh, because so often, I mean, maybe you've heard this when you, you mention member care, people say, oh, that's counseling, isn't it? And then, no, <laughs> that's just one bit. Um, now that comes under specialist at the top, but there's a lot, uh, whole other layers. And I find that very comforting because it can be a heavy burden when you think you have to take care of everything for, for your workers or so. So I find it great comfort to know that Jesus is the foundation of care. Even if nobody else cares for you, Jesus cares for you. So that's, that's, that's what we build on. And if people uh, grow in their relationship to the Lord, a lot of care happens on that level then I can care for myself. I can set healthy boundaries. I can learn how to say no. I can purposely choose life-giving things in, uh, in my uh, schedule and not just things that drain me. So there's a lot of things we can do for ourselves. Staff care means peer. I can care for my colleague and they can care for me. It starts with, you know, when somebody comes in the, into the office in the morning that we do say, hello, good morning, how are you? You know, and meaning it, you know. <laughs> uh, shepherd care refers to leadership. I think leaders have a responsibility to care for their staff, not just use them as workers. And uh, hopefully we also have healthy, helpful structures in place in, you know, staff manual or policies that are helpful. You know, do we have like an annual holiday? Is it planned into the structure? Or uh, maybe small groups uh, or one-on-ones? Is that in our structure? Then sender support refers to our home base, home churches, home families, friends. There's a lot of things they can do to help us and support us. And if all those things are in place and functioning, the specialist care at the top is actually not needed so much. The, and that would be the psychologists uh, or a doctor or things like that, uh, uh, or a, a specialized counselor. So hopefully if we have the bottom six things in place we don't need the number seven uh, so often or so i found that very helpful there's a whole uh, there's a lot more teaching on this and actually i've put a one page the seven s's in a nutshell is also in your literature pack that you get um and it, it Basically, in one page, it explains what I just shared with you about that. Yes, wow, that was a lot of stuff. But we covered like the missionary, that, that's the ministry years. This could be decades. <laughs> um, okay, now I'm going to stop talking and I'll send you back into breakout rooms. And uh, the question for you to ponder is reflect on your own missionary journey and share with each other at what times would you have appreciated or needed support and then be specific what would that support have looked like what kind of support and uh, maybe you can take a few notes so that you still remember afterwards um, and and we'll see maybe depending on time uh, i want maybe some feedback also okay so what at what times in your journey would you have needed or appreciated some sort of support from member care or who knows and what would that support look like and it can be many different things okay shelby
So, welcome back. Um, how about using the chat again? I'd love to hear uh, a little bit about kind of um, where where would have some sort of help or support or a listening ear been good and what kind of help would have been helpful? Just write it in the chat and Heidi can read it out to all of us. Resources for how to get debriefing. What does furlough and sabbatical mean and look like? Well, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We've just talked a little bit about debriefing during uh, the breakouts, and we realize many people don't really know what debriefing is or have wrong ideas about it. And I think we can really help people uh, in, by explaining and uh, also providing options where they can talk about experiences. Um, is everybody familiar with debriefing, the, the word, or uh, really means uh, after something that you've done outreach or or even several years of missions life you go and share about it uh, including all the feelings and about the good things and also the bad things just to help you process and kind of bring closure emotionally also to a phase of life or just a two-week outreach it could be either yeah and it's it's very helpful uh, to go then on to the next step. Okay, mm -hmm. anything else? Yes. Here are two more. More support mm -hmm. in the transition between different roles and responsibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and other one, encouraging young people to raise support, mm -hmm. putting in the effort and including funds for holidays mm -hmm. and dining out with friends. Yeah, that's true, yeah. And I hope that Ryan will share about this tomorrow. The ideal time for that is before you go on the field, not when you're there. Yeah. Yeah. Just thinking back of my own mission journey, I started out, mm -hmm. I grew up in Switzerland and started out in a base, in a vibrant base in Switzerland that was strongly, strongly impacted by Swiss culture. And I think some of the things Hannes is sharing now about the different areas of adjustment, that would have helped me greatly to know ahead of time, because I, in a way, run a little bit naive into a different culture. So just awareness and, mm -hmm. and information would have helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Another one, helping us to understand the difference of being singles on a team to returning as a married couple. Mm -hmm. Member care and leadership check-in during this transition would have been helpful. Mm. Yeah. Like you are, as singles, you're on the same team and then you go home and get married and return as a married couple. Wow, yes, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the same anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it may look the same to people on the team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My hope is that eventually uh, YWAM is, we're learning, we're growing, but to have a member care person on each team or available to each team, maybe just one per country. It depends, like in Central Europe, we're very spread thinly. Um, but uh, just that there is somebody that you can trust uh, and go to with these sort of questions uh, about, you know, maybe a little coaching about sabbatical or mentoring about a transition or uh, debriefing about some experience. Um, if you have, if you know who to call, basically, I think that would be uh, already a, a huge step forward. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, those are good, good things.
We've organized uh, like uh, fundraising seminars for our Albanian YWAMers who really struggled to, to get their finances together and didn't even know how to start. So we invited some, the expert in, we didn't have to do it ourselves, but we organized it and that was helpful. Muted. Just support in general. I was often thrown into the deep end. Of course, this only happens in YWAM. I know that this is not a problem in, in any other agency. <laughs> oh, yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I found this uh, this cake with the seven layers of support uh, very helpful because it gives you categories also to think, uh, you know, like what could be done on a team level uh, as peer mentoring, maybe, or what could I encourage maybe the leadership to think about or help people? How can they connect better with their home church on the sender support? So that was, to me, it's a great structure to hang in a lot of these issues. Uh, uh, that was quite, because it can feel overwhelming. Where do I even start with all the support? But uh, yeah, that was, that was helpful, was the seven S. Yeah. Okay, seven S, and now we're coming to the finish finishing well hopefully and closer and exit um, um, dick is going to uh, talk about uh, re-entry on friday and re-entry kind of starts on the field already um, i think the the worst things i've i've witnessed was when some crisis happened either on the field or at home where people had to leave uh, with no notice or short notice uh, and just being ripped out of one setting and dumped in, in a completely different setting with no time to process. That, that's awful when that happens and often quite traumatic. So. Um, Oh, no, let's go back. So ideally, when um, we moved from Albania to Germany, I think about a year before we we talked to our kids about it. I mean, they were like eight and ten at that time, so it was easier, like they understood. And we made a few plans to to kind of uh, okay, what we still have one year. What is there something you want to do before we go? And we did fun things like, like, oh, let's go to back to our favorite secret beach that, you know, we haven't been to for a while or, uh, and we always wanted to do that and we haven't. So let's do it now before we go. So that was helpful uh, to start planning like six months to a year, maybe ahead and, and, hopefully it's it's a time also to celebrate and uh, uh yeah and also as as it comes closer uh, an exit interview which is not the same as a debriefing an exit interview should be offered by the team or the uh, leadership or the member care person it's kind of an operational debrief and it's the information that's gathered there is is fed back to to the team or team leadership like how can you guys improve uh you know and maybe if somebody's leaving sort of an anger this provides an opportunity to say why they're leaving so an exit interview could be really helpful and then debriefing uh, if you've been there many years uh uh, don't do it, you know, in a single day. <laughs> Ideally, uh, I think, you know, if, if you're processing several years, you need several days to actually uh, process that in a debriefing. And that could happen on the field. It could happen in a neutral in-between location, or it could happen at home. 
and yeah, just to be prepared for for that re-entry and transition phase. Uh, that's that's uh, important, I think. Um, yeah, I'll show you a book at the end about it. But now let's go to there's a really helpful acronym called RAFT. Uh, the R stands for reconciliation. So it means if you have difficult or broken relationships uh, out uh, on the field, uh, do anything in your power to, to reconcile, to say sorry, to make up. You may not be best friends ever after, but it will take off baggage off your shoulder when you go into the next situation. Um, it's so easy to, I'll, I'll never see the person again, so I, I don't have to do that. But you're doing yourself a favor if you reconcile and try the best you can to, to, to make up. Then affirmation is we can say thank you to so many people that have been friends and helpful kind of real celebration and honor them. Um, uh, that that can be uh, a, a quite a joyful occasion and plan, you know, farewell parties. Uh, and that's next. Yeah. Uh, even my daughter hates farewells, but to say your farewells and actually not just to people, but also maybe to things or to places. You know, maybe even foods, you know, have a farewell party at your favorite restaurant, you know, one last time. Or maybe even take a special object that, uh, that reminds you of your time there, take it home. Like Doris and I, we, we splurged and bought a, a painting of one of the Albanian lakes. Uh, uh, and a view that we were very familiar with, and it hangs in our living room now uh, as a special keepsake. And then uh, think ahead, uh, think about where you're going, your destination. Um, kind of plan ahead, <laughs> let your people at home know <laughs> that you're coming. Um, and uh, Dick will talk a lot more about that. Yeah, and as I've said, uh, um, debriefing and an exit interview is really, really helpful for a healthy closure and exit. And I'm not going to say more about that. So there is a question in the chat. Okay. From Chilean, what is a good amount of time to exit well? What would mm -hmm. you recommend, especially if you have been there a long mm -hmm. time? Right. Uh, first, I want to recommend another book. It's called back home or going back home. This is about re-entry and uh, transitions. Um, very thin, written by friends of ours, uh, available in German too. And they say uh, six months to a year is a good amount of time to, to start thinking about it. Then it's not rushed. And uh, there's a funny transition process going on where you slowly pull back from your things in on field and you're heading into this limbo situation. And like, we were really surprised that some of our best friends, as soon as they heard that we are leaving, they pulled back and we thought at first, oh, they don't like us anymore. But actually they were just afraid of the painful separation. You know, it was because they liked us so much, they didn't know how to handle that. And uh, so it was awkward a bit, but when you're aware of it, uh, you can kind of proactively either talk about it with them, and say, okay, how are we gonna do that uh, in the next couple of months? Um, yeah, so I think six months or maybe even a year could be healthy. Um, yeah, uh, don't don't wait till the last minute. And please, unless your children are or the kids are very small, we're talking like toddlers, tell them ahead of time because they need to go through that transition and maybe the grieving process of losing 
they're they're little buddies uh you know if you we, we've seen oh, it was heartbreaking you know they didn't tell them like until a week before and then it was nearly too late for the children to say goodbye and i think they really were damaged by it so involve the children and it can be even fun you know thinking together what are the fun things that we we used to do here and that we want to do a last time so yeah that would be something to to do okay so i think i've shown you all my books um it's nice to have a little library. You don't need to be the expert about everything because you can just hear, read that. <laughs> that that's helpful. So so I, we have several copies usually at hand. Uh, sometimes we do get them back. Sometimes we don't. But it's good to have that. And then on your paper at the bottom, uh, there's a website called missionarycare.org. Uh, it's amazing. It's really uh, your one-stop resource. Uh, uh, they've written little pamphlets that you can print on an A4 and like triple fold about like a hundred different topics and always from a biblical perspective. And you can print a bunch and then use it to teach and hand it out afterwards, missionarycare.org. Uh, it's fantastic. It's really, uh, yeah. I mean, of course, there's lots of stuff on the internet, but that uh, I highly recommend uh, for any topic, uh, they have it. <laughs> and it's free and it's un without copyright, except like, use their name on it, you know, just print them. Yes. So any other questions? I'm muting. So uh, it's just a very practical question because the information like these sheets, mm -hmm. uh, I guess they're personal, but some of the other forms that Shelby sent us, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, could we give it to other missionaries, just the forms? I think so, yes. That's really good. Yeah, yes. I was thinking, my yes. pastor is doing a master's. Mm -hmm on how to help missionaries. So it might be good for him to mm -hmm. get if it's okay with you guys. Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, if there is a name underneath the leave it on or so, but uh, like the, what was it? The cross-cultural questionnaire, I modified it too. And I just added my name. Uh, I mean, this is a collaborative thing over 10 years, you know, yeah. people have revised it. Yeah. And yeah, maybe be careful notes? with- uh, Can your notes be given as well or? Uh, the paper. Um, you give. Which one is it? Mine. Well, well, the one you you gave us, the one that the one that says the one we're using today. Right. Um, I didn't think about it. I didn't put my name at the bottom or so. Uh, maybe maybe not in their hundreds, but if you are in a personal rela conversation with somebody and you yeah. re realize this would be helpful, yeah. uh, okay, sure, okay. yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. All right. Oh, gosh, time's up. But oh. I would like us to use five minutes. And maybe you write uh, uh, just we, we can stay on uh, just a quick reflection. What am I taking away from today? Write down three things. We're not sharing them. This is your personal reflection time. Just what am I taking away from today? Hey, Tana, thank you very much for giving us such a good overview over the missionary life cycle. Very practical thoughts about on-field season. Super helpful. Um, if after today you have any question that pops up in your mind, please feel free to write us to the MCRT email account, and then we will try to respond as good as we can. Um, we are sure looking forward to again connect tomorrow when Ryan will share about the pre-field preparation, same time, two o'clock. Yeah, um, I hope this has been helpful and inspiring for all of you. And just a big thank you for taking the time to join the seminar and to engage. And I wish we would have more time 
to hear your thoughts and mm -hmm. continue to process. Mm -hmm. But now it's definitely time to have a good rest. So have a restful evening and we're looking forward to see you all tomorrow.